Okay, over to you, Charlie. Thank you. For our next talk, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Juan Manuel Pedrosa Leal. Um, Juan, please tell us about your living history. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I think this is a great idea, and it's great that people you know, can see other people's pets and not the idealized pet that you sort of imagine when you start. I thought a lot about what the points I wanted to make were, but I figured you know, people on this series have made them more eloquently than I ever could. So I'm just going to sort of quickly tell you my random walk along science and make some comments along the way. So first of all, I'm from Colombia, so this country right here. And uh, Colombia doesn't have uh, very many scientists and even fewer physicists. So when I initially told my father that I wanted to be a physicist, he, what his reaction was, well, are you going to be a high school teacher? You're going to starve. And he's an engineer. So I said, well, OK, I'll do physics and engineering. He's a civil engineer. So I said, I'll do civil engineering too, just so I don't starve later. And uh, I started uh, doing that. But along the way, I realized engineering really wasn't my thing. And uh, I started taking maths classes just because some of my friends were mathematicians, and I liked that too. So I ended up doing a double undergrad in maths and physics. But funnily, like uh, Suraj said, my initial election before decision before going in was between literature and physics. But I naively thought, well, if when I'm 40, I want to switch to literature from physics is easier than the other way around. But now I realize it isn't. But I'm not unhappy with my choice. And uh, uh, what I realized later is that I was incredibly lucky uh, because I grew up in a place that looks like this. Most people imagine Colombia looks like a jungle. Uh, but my weekends were in a place that looks like this, in the foothills of the Andes, where it meets the Amazon. So I had the whole experience of living in South America, but I had all the advantages of living in a modern big city. And I went to the German school, which was excellent academically because it was supported by the German government and it had to uh, comply with the standards of the German government, the Colombian government, so it was amazing. And I tried to look for old pictures because I thought some of the talks that I liked used mostly old pictures to illustrate their things. And the only one I found was this, which is what was from a theater play, uh, The Physicists by Duramat. And the, the, sort of the main point of all what I'm going to say is that you are really uh, molded by the people that you're with. And people in this series have given a lot of thanks to mentors and uh, professors, and that's definitely worth it. But uh, what I wanted to emphasize is the people that are around you, not uh, just your mentors, but uh, just your the students that are with you. And uh, some of you might recognize this person. So this is me. And this is Herman Enciso, who's now a professor at Irvine, and who also did a postdoc at the Harvard System Biology Department. He randomly happened to be in my class. Uh, and uh, then oops. before I started university, I knew I wanted to do physics, but I thought I wanted to do high energy physics. And I had the, the fortune to get selected for a program at the Weizmann Institute of Science, uh, which was basically you go for a month and you work as an assistant to a postdoc in the area that you're interested in. So I did a one month internship in, in uh, high energy physics. And it was very, very useful because it helped me realize that I didn't like uh, high energy physics. And thinking back on, on that, I think I just wanted to do high energy physics because it seemed like the hardest topic. And it was just ego, like, I'm so smart, I want to work on the hardest thing. But once I realized what it actually was, it really wasn't my thing. So it was very lucky that I didn't spend too much time on it because I realized it just before I started my career. Then I um, uh, started uh, physics at Uniandes, as I told you, the so, so, so Columbia's top research university. And uh, again, I was incredibly lucky by the people I was surrounded with. So two of the, the people that were with me were the youngest uh, people ever uh, inducted into the Colombian Academy of Sciences. One uh, later won a MacArthur scholarship. And it was a very small group. Like there were eight of us doing physics and math. So it, I at the time I didn't realize it. I thought, oh, this is what studying physics is like. But I was really lucky in the people that were around me and thinking back on it, it really sort of determined the trajectory that my life took later on. And so the main lesson so far is appreciate your privilege. I didn't realize at the time how lucky I was with the sort of opportunities that I had. 
don't let ego get in the sense of what gives you a sense of wonder. So don't study high energy physics just because you think it's hard. I saw that happen later later on with the uh, string theory. I found a lot of people that were interested in theory in string theory, not just because they thought it was a great topic to study, but just they thought it's the hardest one and I'm so smart. So not it's not only me who makes that mistake. And really to realize that a big uh, part of luck is the people that surround you. A lot of other speakers in the series have mentioned the huge role of luck and uh, that you know you should be prepared to receive your good luck, but also you should appreciate that sometimes luck is just the people that you happen to be surrounded with. Uh, after I entered the university, I ended up working in dynamical systems theory and chaos under Philip Binder, who was, uh, at the time, the physics department had just switched from being a teaching department to a research department. He had just come back from doing his PhD at Yale, and so he was very inspirational. I liked a lot uh, the work that I did with him, but at the end, I decided I wanted to work in statistical mechanics. So when I applied uh, uh, to university I, and I got into MIT, I thought, I know who I want to work with. I'm going to do theory in statistical mechanics. And when I got there, the professor that I wanted to work with had just retired gone back to Turkey. So I got there and I had to figure out what I wanted to do. I had absolutely no idea. I had never had any interest in, bi interest in biology. But then I ran into a group of people, the Van Uden Arden Lab at MIT, and they just were so much fun. They were just a really fun group of people, a bunch of you know physicists who didn't really know any biology, but thought the questions were interesting and were willing to sort of randomly try it. And you might recognize some of these people, like Murata Jari is now a professor at Yale, Arpita has spoken in this series, uh, Mukun Tatai has spoken in the BPB series as well. Uh, but it was really a decision made on just liking the people and figuring if I'm going to spend every waking moment for the next five years in a lab, I better like the people in that lab. And it ended up being the best decision of my life. I you know I now love the topic. I found it really interesting, but it was a leap of faith because I really had zero knowledge of biology. I remember the first group meeting that I went to. I don't remember what I asked, but I remember the answer was no because DNA is a double helix. And I was like, okay. So this gives you an idea of how little I need. But really, it it I mean, even if it hadn't worked out on the topic that I ended up really liking. Just the experience of being with people that are supportive and that you enjoy talking about science and enjoy spending the time in the lab with is really the best thing you can do to further your career in science and to enjoy it, which is even more important. And also, uh, and here I worked in uh, Noise Indeed Networks, but uh, under the wonderful tutelage of Alex van Rudenarden, who had just started like six months before as a professor, as the first uh, biophysics professor at MIT. And I want to tell another little story. I had a crazy motorcycle accident like two years into my PhD. I was run over by a car and dragged for a while. So for I spent months in a hospital on that. And when I came back to MIT, I had just started doing some experiments on my main project. And uh, first, everyone was wonderful about visiting me and helping me and all that. But Alex uh, was, I mean, I, this is a guy I will always admire for this. He sort of rearranged his schedule so that he could do my experiments because my hands were screwed up from my, from my accident. So for six months, I spent like three months in the hospital and the other three months I was in the lab sort of watching him do my experiments because I couldn't. So it was really a decision of, uh, the decision of, you know, choosing nice people really paid off at that moment. So I'm forever thankful for, to him for that. And uh, yeah, I ended up working in noise engine networks. And it's interesting also because that's not what he wanted to work in initially. The, the lab was initially meant to work in the kind of things Arpita told you about, uh, dynamics uh, of uh, acting polymerization. But then Alex was so um, sort of free in letting us choose topics that uh, basically Mukund and Arturo convinced me him that this was interesting and he let us do it. And the lab ended up going sort of entirely in that direction after a few years. So that's also something that uh, I find amazing and I hope to emulate here in my own lab. And later on, I went to the Paulson lab and that was also kind of random because I thought I wanted to do my postdoc in Europe. So I met uh, Johan Paulson uh, through Mukund at a conference in Baltimore when I was still in the hospital. So I, I went all, you know, bandages everywhere. My first outing to the hospital was to a conference and then Mukund introduced me to Johan. And uh, later we met again at a conference in Israel and he said, yeah, sure, 
you know, why don't you come work with me? I hadn't even applied. I had just started thinking applying, but she said, yeah, I know what you're doing. It's great. Let's work together. But I'm uh, moving away from Cambridge. I'm going to Harvard. And if I had said, I'm going to, I don't know, Illinois or LA, I, I, I probably would have thought, no, I really want to live in Europe. But since I was already in Boston, you know, all my friends were there. I said, okay, you know, what the hell, let's go to Harvard. And again, it worked wonderful. But in this case, it was funny because the, the lab was also just starting. I had learned from Alex that it was a great idea to go with a young professor. And that's a point that uh, other people in this series have made, that it's very different to work in a lab that is well-established where you are sure to publish, but you will see the professor once a year versus a newly established lab where you know, you'll work with the professor every day. You'll probably have a lot of support. You'd run the risk of him not getting tenure. But uh, it really worked out for me with Alex. So I went the same route. Let's go with this young professor who's trying to do something new and see how it works out. It implies a lot of buying equipment and all that, but it's still a good investment. And uh, I, in, the, in this case, it wasn't so much that it was a nice group of people because when I joined the lab, it was just me and Dan Hu. But uh, Alex had a, uh, sorry, Johan had a, the explicit policy of choosing nice people, not only great people. So that was part of the interview process was the science and how good they were. But uh, another part was talking to us afterwards and saying, okay, do you guys get a good buy? Do you think you could work with this guy? So he managed to create a lab that grew slowly that had this whole, you know, the good vibe is important philosophy at the heart of it. And I, I have to say there was, for example, another lab at Harvard where the professor was a great guy, but the lab was a mess so much that he had to have people work in different organisms so that they wouldn't screw with each other's media, which I thought was terrible. How could you live like that? And I, again, the guy was very nice. So he, he, it wasn't like he was an evil guy and created that atmosphere, but I guess he didn't take care of, you know, creating the right atmosphere. Uh, and that's something that Venki mentioned in the series that, uh, you know, creating positive lab dynamics is very important. So it's something that you should look for when you're joining a lab and when you create your lab, you should take care that that happens because it doesn't happen sort of by itself. Um, and sorry. Well, sorry to jump in, but you are nearly out of time, couple of minutes. Okay, so I'll get to my main point that as Ned Wingreed said, focus on the people and not the topic. So it's really the science will follow if you generate nice dynamics and choose people that you're you know, happy to work with. And that's what will later get you to doing great science. And I guess I'll stop there because otherwise I'll go on and on. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for a terrific talk, Juan. Thank um, you. Yeah, and I guess, uh, I have a question to, to follow up on this. Um, you, you touched upon um, choosing to be around uh, the right people, nice people, and also choosing the topic that you work on based on what gives you that sense of wonder, um, not what you think you should be working on. Uh, I think this is, both of these can be difficult advice for young people to follow. So how do you, you know, encourage them to, to, to do this? Well, you, you can never, you know, know the lab atmosphere before you join. And often you join just, you know, by papers and a small interview. But it's really worth if you, you know, take the time to talk to all the people in a lab, not just the PI before you join a lab. That's sort of good practice for getting that, uh, you know, for choosing nice people. But also, so and asking not only what are you working on, but how is the lab atmosphere? It's something that you can actually ask and people will tell you in general, or at least they'll be evasive and you'll know it's not that great. But in terms of uh, choosing what gives you a sense of wonder, of course, it's tricky to know what gives you a sense of wonder before you've explored a lot of topics. But uh, I think the other side is easier. If you think you want to do something because it's something that, you know, uh, it's very productive or you're more likely to get a paper or, it's a topic that people say is cool. It's rather easy to, you know, if you really look inside yourself to know that you're not doing that for the right reasons, because oops, because when uh, you really have wonder for what you're doing, it happens by itself and you, you really notice it and, and you find yourself spending long nights uh, doing something that you don't know if it's going to be productive or not. So I think it's just taking the time to check yourself that will tell you if you're doing it or not. 
Yeah, great, great. Thank you. And thank you again for a fantastic talk. I'm uh, plotting on behalf of the audience.